Please be seated. Scripture tells us that whoever believes in Christ will not be put to shame. So now, as we stand shoulder to sh shoulder in worship this day, we are reminded, stand confident in the promises of God. And let us now confess our sin before God and one another, awaiting the pure grace that abounds in Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Almighty God, your word offers freedom from sin, but we confess that we have not obeyed your word. We have harbored malice toward our enemies. We have been deceitful in our relationships. We have been insincere in our commitments. Through gossip, we have slandered our friends. Forgive us our sins and lead us to genuine repentance. Help your children long for your pure spiritual milk that we may grow into the joy of salvation through Jesus Christ. Take a moment now for personal confession. Amen. Sisters and brothers, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Let me see your smiles. We have been forgiven by God's grace. The slate has been washed clean. A time to smile and give joy and thanks to God. The peace of Christ be with you. Please share that grace around this room. Uh, hugs, handshakes, high fives.
please be seated and I invite the children to come forward now for our children's message. Good morning. Thank you for being here today. Good morning to you. How are you? Good, good. You're good? Are y'all doing good? I'm so glad you're doing well. Well, this, I have had so much fun being here, but this is our, my last day, Sandy, here, and so we're saying goodbye. Did you know the word goodbye is a com compression of the words, God be with you? And so while we're saying goodbye, we're saying also, God be with you. And so that's what I want. My wish for you, my prayers for you, is that you always experience God's grace in your lives. And I want to tell you that uh, someone new is coming. Have you heard the news of the new pastor? A little bit? Well, I've got a picture for you. I wish I had planned ahead and put it up on the screen, but here is a picture. Count how many children he has, he and she. Ha. Three You've got new friends coming. Isn't that neat? What do you think? I think it's pretty cool. And, you know, y'all have been a very warm and friendly and welcoming congregation. So my charge to you is also to be friends with these new brothers and sisters you have in Christ. And there, Evan is uh, the oldest. Evan, can you say Evan? Evan. Evan is 11. Who's near 11? Who's... All right, good. You've got a new friend, Evan. All right, so you remember his name and you'll welcome him, okay? And then uh, they have an eight-year-old. Who's, who's up near eight? <gasps> good. Well, her name is Addie. Addie is eight years old. And so be sure and welcome her. And then the, the youngest in the family is Asher. Asher is five. How, who's five around? <gasps> Yay, look, already new friends. That is fabulous. That is super cool. So remember, Asher is five, Addie is eight, and Evan is 11. And I hope you'll, you'll welcome them the way you have welcomed me. And as I leave here, I want to leave you one last lesson. I have so enjoyed our vacation Bible school and our ranch day. I rode a horse when I was here. Such fun. And we had all these uh, times together in children's uh, church message. Um, but here's what I want you to take away. This is important, and that is, and it's in a simple song with these words. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And scripture says there is nothing, there's nothing ever you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. That's the message I want you to know. That's the message I want you to share when you welcome uh, new people at, at your schools and at your church. Know that um, they are loved and so are you. Thank you for welcoming me and, and allowing me to be your pastor these, this, these years. So let us pray. Gracious and mighty God, we ask your blessings upon these precious children. Help them to continue to know how valued and loved they are. May they also know that they too are an instrument of your love and grace. And may they seek always to share love with others as you have so, shown so generously your love in Jesus Christ. Bless them. Bless the new family and pastor that come um, in the coming weeks. Enrich their lives by your grace. Amen. Thank you so much. So, high five. You may go to children's church, or you may go back with your parents.
That was spectacular. <laughs> and they will be doing um, the choral uh, service. What, what do y'all call it? Next, it's next week, so they have warmed up. And you know, we, uh, some, we don't uh, applaud. Uh, we take time on a Sunday, and we will appreciate our choir and our directors. We, the reason we don't is because uh, y'all are not the audience. You may feel like you are, but you are not. God is the audience, and we together are worshiping. And so God is smiling, no doubt, this day. It's a beautiful uh, song and prayer and song. Thank you. Let us now um, uh, turn to Scripture and let us pray. Lord, as we listen to your ho holy word, uh, open our hearts to the power of your spirit. Call us out of darkness and lead us into your marvelous, amazing light. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this morning is from the Gospel of John, the 14th chapter, beginning at the very first uh, verse of that chapter. You will discover these to be very familiar words to you. <clears throat> this is Jesus speaking, and he says these wonderful words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. And from now on, you do not know him and have seen, you now, from now on, you do know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if, I, if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. As very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I I'm going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The city of Geneva, Switzerland, of course, that is the... Uh, the father of Presbyterianism did much, uh, John Calvin did his work in Geneva. But in, in the city of Geneva, Switzerland, it, this is a very old city, and it's described to me as having these very narrow, irregular streets in the very ancient parts of the town, and that it has these very wide and irregular streets in the newer sections of the city. And in this large city, I'm told, uh, it is easy to get lost. The one who shared that story with me was a Presbyterian pastor. He and his wife were there visiting and sightseeing and touring, and they had their rental car towed to a distant 
impounding lot when they were there. And there was, they found this French speaking, did not have a, 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 but a scant of information uh, about and knowledge about where their car had been impounded. Um, they said that had it not been for a very helpful Swiss gentleman, they might still be looking for that car. This kind man offered to be their way, to take them in his car to where their car was being kept. So he did not show them the way. He was the way. And so he describes this incident and says, you know, to get into a stranger's automobile in a strange city when one had only a very passing familiarity with the language, he said it took a whole lot of courage. But then he explained that the way he and his wife saw it, they had no choice. There was no way that they could find their car without someone providing them a way. And so in a similar manner, Jesus does not say, there is a way to the Father, or let me draw you a map. He says instead, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. So for all, all who are willing to, to ride with him, Jesus does for us that which we could not do for ourselves. He takes us. He takes us into the presence of God. It takes courage to be a follower of Jesus. But frankly, I don't see, I know for me, I don't have a choice. I am compelled to follow. We cannot make it on our own without one who will take us to the Father. We're lost. I'm lost. This passage this morning from the Gospel of John, it is one of the most beautiful and the most comforting in all of literature, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God and believe also in me. These are words of such great and deep comfort from Jesus' lips. And over and over, these words have come to, have been used to comfort the dying, to console those who mourn, and to strengthen the doubting hearts. These words are often used in funeral services. And I know, I acknowledge, we have had our more than our fair share in my walk with you in the last 16 months. And these words have been shared in our memorial services. And they have given us strength. And they have provided us comfort. And it is well that they should be read and, and um, during services like a funeral. Uh, for this is exactly the context of which they come. Jesus is preaching his own funeral service on the night before he is to die. The disciples were with Jesus on that very last night when he spoke these words, and he had just told them that one of them would betray him. And he also informed Peter that he would deny him on that very night. So it was in this atmosphere of shame, sorrow, and self-doubt that Jesus hurled these words of comfort. And when I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. At a high school basketball banquet, many of those happening throughout Northwest Arkansas in the, in the month of May, but when we celebrate accomplishments of our seniors and our students, this particular banquet, they had invited um, as a keynote speaker a, a very slight built, relatively short college basketball player and he was invited to address the crowd. And this young man, though he was of a shorter stature than most, he, he had played successfully college basketball in what would be considered a land of giants. And he reported that he gave away several inches and in numbers of pounds each time that he, for his team, each time he walked out on the court. But he told this crowd that night that part of his success was in knowing his limitations. And that, I think, is, the, is important. It is important uh, for each of us, not just for athletes, but for all of life. And, in, and one of our limitations is that we cannot be good enough to earn our way into the presence of the Lord. That's why I want the children to hear the message. While we might want to, to, to um, engage fear in our children to keep them from breaking rules, the truth is nothing can separate them from the love of God. Now, there are consequences to bad choices, and they will learn that. But they are loved, we are loved, and we can never be good enough to earn our place in the presence of the Lord. We need to know our limitations. It's only as we realize that God was in Christ on the cross for our sake, only as we accept that Jesus is the way to the Father do we have any hope for life eternal, for abundant life now? Only as we accept that Jesus is the way to the Father do we have eternal hope. The one who has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. So it is in Jesus' willingness to die for us that the love of God on our behalf comes very, very clear. So what is our greatest need? It is not food. It is not a new car or a college degree or even happiness. Our greatest need is to be accepted. Our greatest need is to be loved. Loved at the very deepest level of our being. It is to know that the past, with all its errors and sins, is not being held against us that there is meaning for our present lives, and that the future is ripe with hope. That's where we as a congregation stand today, ripe with hope. This is what the cross says to us, that God in Christ on the cross bridges the gap is the bridge, the gap between God and us and draws us to God in un unconditional love. And so I tell you today, heaven is not a place that we go to, but a relationship in which we participate. What a friend 
we have in Jesus. And anywhere, anytime that we experience the unconditional love of God, that's where heaven touches earth. This has been a place for us to share a deep love and appreciation for one another. One theologian, let me close with, put it this way when talking about Jesus and heaven and eternal life. And it is, it is not in heaven that one finds God, but in God one finds heaven. And I would argue it is in the community of God's people that we experience the touch and the flutter of God's grace where the two come together. And so today we do celebrate. We celebrate the gifts of women and we honor our mothers everywhere. Scripture tells us to honor thy, our mothers and our fathers and we, we wish to be, obey the, the commandments to do so. But also today marks for us the day we say goodbye and Godspeed. God be with you. I want to tell you again that the farewell reception on Thursday was a beautiful celebration. And as I said, you know, a really good goodbye sets you up for a really glorious hello. And so I'm excited for you. We had a glorious goodbye, and you're going to have an even greater hello very soon. I was humbled by the attendance of the, at the reception. You just outdid yourselves. I mean, I was bracing for a Thursday night at 5.30, and who's going to come? And we're not serving wine, so. <laughs> but there you were in all your glory, expressing countless appreciation and gratitude for me when I just say, the gratitude and the appreciation is mine. I know my limitations, and I thank you for accepting me and loving me and letting us each touch a little place where God connects us. I love you. I have enjoyed serving as your transitional pastor. And so now we arrive at a milestone an important time in the life of this congregation as we each are launching out in new ways and untried territories. I don't know where my next adventure will be, but I take you with me in the time we've had together. It will inform how I serve the next group of God's people I'm called to serve. So as we adventure forward, let us remember what Jesus said to his disciples. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. May it be so for you. Amen. Let us stand today and affirm our faith. Let us use the Apostles' Creed, an ancient baptismal creed used as a catechism for teaching believers. Let us say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He, since he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. As we move into our pastoral prayer, I, I'm, I'm going to take a personal moment, and I'm going to go on ahead and ask, ask forgiveness anyway. Blake, forgive me. But it has been, in this moment, I'm a, I may cry. 
that I watched him stand and pray and sing. And that's pretty unbelievable that you have gone through the accident and that I, before I leave here, get to see you stand on your own two feet. What grace. Thank you. Thank you. I just, as we pray this day, and we have been praying for, for Blake's healing and uh, such a wonderful witness um, to God's power. Uh, as I pray, I'm going to say the words, God of resurrection. And when I say God of resurrection, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayers. Let us unite our hearts in prayer this morning. Let us pray for the church throughout the world that all who profess to honor the risen Lord may be faithful in their witness and courageous in their testimony to the ways of Jesus, God of resurrection. We pray this day for pastors everywhere, for teachers throughout our nation, for ministers throughout the world, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that they may seek to build the church upon Christ, the cornerstone, and humbly lead in faithful service, God of resurrection. And let us pray and lift up to you, mighty God, the governments of the world and its leaders. We especially pray for our presidents and for our governor of the state of Arkansas, that the nation may dwell in peace, that goodwill prevail over strife, and people of faith may freely worship as their hearts direct. God of resurrection. And we pray and give thanks for the rain and sun and proper measure and for abundant food and water for all who dwell upon the earth. God of resurrection. We pray for the sick and those in need. We thank you for those who have seen, we have seen your healing hand touch them and, and, and mold them, shape them into a wonderful witness of your power and love. We pray for all and anyone who is oppressed by wounds of their souls, by the heartache and heartbreak of mental illness, God of resurrection. And we pray for our neighbors that we may live together in amity and that strangers among us may find us to be hospitable friends, God of resurrection. And we pray for our enemies, that their sins may be forgiven them, and that they may find your peace, God of the resurrection. And we give thanks for the gifts of all women. We are especially thankful for those women in our lives who have nurtured us and encouraged us and helped us grow in your ways. God of the resurrection. And Almighty God, your Son promised to grant whatever we ask in his name by your holy power. Holy Spirit, empower us to minister to the world as his faithful disciples. And together, let us close this prayer, saying, t praying together the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As people of God, let us offer ourselves and the fruit of our labor for God's work in the world. If the ushers will please come forward and let us receive the offering this morning.
God, receive the gifts we bring in gratitude for your astounding goodness. Make our lives to be an acceptable offering in union with our risen Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever. Amen. Well, I don't have any words as poetic as our poet, Jean Tovar, but my words are no less sincere. Reverend Crawford has been a blessing to this congregation. He brought her talents and experiences to Greendale to help us discern God's will and his vision for the heart of his community of faith. Her ministry is unique chosen to be a transitional pastor she has and trained. So she came a year ago prepared to prepare us for a new pastor. They did more. A lot of our respect and love. She takes her work seriously. She doesn't take her too seriously. To laugh at herself but one of her many endearing qualities. Being in her presence inescapably brings the realization that her faith is real. Her God is part of her being, and her life is centered on Christ. That cannot be faked over time. That conviction either rings true or is exposed as shallow piety or contrived faith. To spend time with Chris Crawford is inevitably to be drawn closer to God. Her life consistently bears witness to the grace embodied in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Obviously, her religious beliefs are strengthened by her life experiences and her study of God's word. That resonates clearly whenever she speaks. Her leadership of the session has been both firm and kindly. She has guided your session and this congregation in new directions. She cajoled us into taking risks. She views her role as a transitional pastor to question some things and affirm others. Chris taught us to examine those things which we do because we have always done them that way. And she also steadied us in those bedrock principles which form the cornerstone of our church. She helped us focus on matters of importance and turn loose of the trivialities that can strangle a congregation. In the short time she has been among us, she has helped us to be all we can be. But she has also taught us that our growth as a community of faith is ongoing. Each stride encourages a more mature faith, but leaves us with the realization how much more we can grow. Chris, 
with thanksgiving to God for having called you here, we sadly must acknowledge this is the time you must move on. You leave this place better for your having been here. Our love for you and gratitude to you is genuine and heartfelt. This time was a bit too short for our liking, but we respect your work. We know God will call you to yet another place where you will again help that next church through a transition. When you came, we were mourning the separation from our beloved pastor, Stuart Smith. You helped us realize that we get through the difficult times by having faith. You taught us to not let change be so unsettling. You helped us to know that we could love again. From the beginning, we knew your stay would be brief. Notice I didn't say short. But it, <laughs> <clears throat> but it does not make saying goodbye any easier. You have done what you told us you would do. You comforted us when we were sick. You grieved with us. You celebrated with us. You washed our feet. You have empowered us, emboldened us, and strengthened us. But most importantly, like our Father in heaven, you have loved us unconditionally, and we could not ask for more than that. I am so unworthy, <laughs> but I am so grateful. And I, um, Charlie, I, and Jean, and all of you, I, your grace has changed me. And there aren't words. And I'm a pastor. <laughs> so let me just close now with our final benediction. I want for you to go from here with open arms, with heads held high, with love in your hearts, and know that you are loved. And I want you to remember that God is like a rock, always the foundation under our feet. That God is like a roof, always protecting and is over our heads. That God is also like the horizon that stretches out beyond us, pulling us forever forward. And that like a pitcher of water, God is within us and God is in the pouring out of us. And that like a pebble in the sea, we are in God. So let's each go out into our little places where we live and we laugh and we work and we serve. And let's change that little place on earth. The way God's grace, the way you and your love has changed me, the way God's grace has changed us all. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>